Welcome everyone to uh, the first talk of season two of our workshops. We are very lucky to have Russell Walls from Metaphoric Games uh, talk to you guys this evening. Russell's going to be exploring um, his latest environment and I think looking at a few different techniques and processes that maybe he explored when he was working on that. So Russell, I will pass it over to you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, hi guys. Um, so yeah, today we're going to be looking over my uh, my sewer scene, which is my most recent environment piece that I've posted up onto my art station. Um, so just a, a little overview. Uh, as Paul mentioned, I'm currently a 3D artist at Metaphoric Games. Um, we're working on an unannounced VR title. And it, this is actually my first role in the games industry as a whole. Um, so before that, I worked in simulations for many years. Um, and then I made the transition over last year into the games industry. Um, so yeah, that's super exciting. And this was the last environment that I made before getting my um, first role in, in the industry. So yeah. Um, so yeah, quick introduction into the environment. So if I just alt tab over to it, this is the environment that we're going to be talking over. Um, so this is a sewer environment, which I started working on August, September last year and finished around October. Um, I initially started this to be like a, a really quick turnaround environment, uh, just to showcase blind pipes and modular pipes for whatever reason. And then it ended up turning into a much larger task where I decided that I wanted to make it turn more into a game space. Um, and then, uh, yeah, we went on from there making way more props than I kind of initially intended to, made more systems than I intended to, made more materials than I intended to. And then um, because of my scatterbrain, that took me into learning more about Lumen and um, cinematic rendering and the like. So, yeah, that's the kind of stuff that we'll be going into first and foremost. Um, so if I just go back to my presentation quickly. Um, so, yeah, uh, we're going to start off talking about lighting and the mood of a scene. Um, so this is kind of like... Um, when I first started the scene, what did I kind of envision? And then how did I tweak my scene to match that vision um, going further in? So my initial thoughts when starting this were sewers are, you know, they're, they're smelly, they're, they're warm, they're, they're very humid. Um, so I tried to get that through the, um, the colors that I used in the scene uh, that be that in the textures or in the lighting itself, um, the density of the fog, um, you know, additional volumes that I could use, and obviously all of the steam particles that you could see. Um, so, for example, um, here, if I just take a quick fly around and then turn on the um, transparency clipping, I have a large fog volume. Um, which isn't just a uh, like the normal fog that you get in Unreal. It's like an actual cube itself where um, I've made like a localized volume for um, generating thicker fog near the floor. I also have one that's coming up through this hatch just to imply that um, in certain areas there's, there's more humidity. Um, so yeah, like getting the the mood is super it's super important or at least for, for this scene it was super important to just get get that coming across um let me just quickly take a look at my notes <laughs> uh, so yeah um so then if we go back into here uh, the next kind of thing that I wanted to look at for this as well to, to really nail the vibe was using the temperature of a light rather than the color. So um, I'm sure most of you are aware um, lights aren't just like the color of a light isn't just controlled by the light color. As you can see, this is just like a base white, but it's emitting a blue light. Um, and that's because I've decided to use temperature over the color. And that's to get a more realistic result and to create a higher contrast between the, the colors that I'm getting from the lighting. 
Um, so essentially areas where um, I'm not using like a, a warm kind of floodlight, as you can see, I'm co that's coming through the main area and it's kind of filling the space uh, in the darker areas. I'm using like the, the hotter red lights and then in the more well lit areas i'm using the cooler lights to kind of create that contrast on the assets and in that general space and it just really helps like create a focal point um so yeah um the kind of thought process behind that as well um i wanted to use the hotter lights to kind of justify the um the the floodlight because there's only a small area in the scene in which the um the natural light comes in um so yeah as a result of that i wanted to kind of make sure that these little spots of hotter light would just create a, a more kind of um you know it would just help the the space justify itself a little bit better um and then obviously adding all of these lights um it helps you avoid one of the key problems that i've i've noticed i used to have in a lot of my environments and i think a lot of people in general have where they end up pushing their scene into like uh, a true black value or a true white value where you end up suppressing a lot of the data um which means that like when you come to do post-processing and things like that, you'll end up losing the ability to, to shift your renders um, in brighter or darker values and it'll end up compressing and crunching down. Um, so that's one area to, uh, to watch out for when, when you're lighting environments like this. Um, of course, though, um, as in all things, right, rules are there to be broken. So... Um, if I quickly go into unlit mode, there's certain areas where I am using true black values, such as on uh, the, the models for my pipes or these grates or like the, the exits for these pipes here or even the behind the gate. Because when you're in lit, it kind of helps sell that there's something beyond that point, but you can't quite see it because the lighting isn't getting back there. Um, so in certain areas, it, it's worth using something along those lines. Um, have we had any questions so far? <laughs> There's a couple of questions from, from me, but I think you can kind of, this is really interesting. You can keep going, I think, for now, and then maybe we can go back to those more at the end, if, if that's okay with okay. you. Okay. Yeah, that's fine by me. Um, so, yeah, jumping on to the next point that I, I kind of wanted to bring up. Um, Post-processing is an absolutely massive part of setting up the, the mood um, for a scene um, because there's so much stuff that you can, you can do in a post-process volume. Um, and when you use them in subtle ways, it, it really helps environments pop. Um, be that through locking down your exposure, for example, to like make an environment appear more dramatic or uh, color grading a space so that oh my hello color grading a space so that you can um, you can really hone in on those cooler colors or or those warmer colors or um, a good example of how I use post processing in this environment is a post process material to increase the sharpness to kind of get rid of those uh, Vaseline effects that you can find in Unreal sometimes and also going back to flood lighting and making sure that your environments don't have true blacks in them using an ambient cube map to, to bring just a touch of light into those areas. Um, so I can show you very quickly my post processor. Um, can you so, just explain what an ambient cube map is as well, just for anyone that maybe isn't? Yeah, sure. Um, so if I just go into my blueprint here, because I've been crazy and I've, I've prefabbed mine out. Um, <laughs> So an ambient cube map, essentially, if I can find where it is, essentially you can input any cube map. Um, so that could be something from 
like Substance Painter or Designer, you can find them there or from your Marmoset, um, or you can download them off the internet or even use the base Epic one, which I've done here. Um, a base cube map essentially will allow you to control um, a cube map that lights the space. So I've got mine very low, but if I set that to, uh, to one, you'll see it adds light everywhere. Um, and then you can rotate that and things as well um, just to like tweak it in certain spaces. <clears throat> so that's how I've kind of gone about making the area just a touch brighter than it would have otherwise been without it. Um, just one more question so yeah. as well, Russell, before you move on. At what point do you kind of do this? So obviously you're talking about like, you know, the post-processing volume and establishing... You know, sure. Um, sort of feel. Is that something you do early on or is that something that you do very much towards the end of your pipeline? So, so for me personally, um, I like to try and get the mood established as early as possible, but without it like um, impeding the modeling process. So I'll, I'll get like the majority of the, the block outs and texturing work implemented. Um, and then like probably about halfway through the process is when I generally start jumping into the, the lighting um, and making sure that it's feeling right. Um, cool. So yeah, um, like getting the, if I just close this down, like deciding that I wanted the blue lights in the, the slightly brighter areas and the red lights in the darker areas, that, that was very much an early decision. Um, but like the post-processing and stuff came a bit later. Okay, cheers. Um, but yeah, um, so if I just jump back into this real quick, um, and then if I just open up some of these, you'll notice that I've hard locked my exposure to manual and set it to a compensation of 11. Um, so I know a lot of people like to do it using the auto exposure histogram and then setting the min and max to one. Um, as you can see, I, I did that earlier in the project, but um, I found that setting it to manual and then using the exposure compensation helped a lot in terms of um, controlling the general kind of effect that the exposure had. Um, so you can like really tweak the amount of like light and dark that's in your scene using that. Um, as you can see, like that's already brought way more contrast into the shadows just by dropping it down to 10.5. Um, so yeah, that is one area that um, I'd recommend people to look at uh, using the exposure to have more of an impact on, on the vibe of the scene as opposed to just setting it to one and then leaving it at that kind of setting. Um, and then what other settings did we play with? Uh, yeah, so um, in this case, in this particular project, I like to use the, the convolution bloom. It seemed to give a bit more of a realistic effect on the bloom as opposed to it just being like a, a ball of glow coming from every single light source. You kind of get like the nice little flicks off the off the bloom that you'd get on a, a camera lens. Yeah. So, yeah, lots of lots of cool little effects that you can get from that. Um, but yeah, so basically what I'm saying is post-processing, very handy should use <laughs> um right and then yeah uh just to to go back into general look and feel of things um so for this project i mentioned on my, my little introduction to it um i started out kind of not really thinking about how i wanted to light it um, decided i wanted to do lumen a little bit later on um and I found that you had to uh, make sure that all of your lights were set to movable. So just remember to do that because otherwise you'll end up getting lots and lots of artifacts in your shadows where there's flickering lights and things. So just a little tidbit for you. That is weird, <laughs> isn't it? That they have a you know a dynamic global illumination system, but the default category for all their lights is like it's stationary, isn't it? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's so it's just just something that you you need to keep on top of when you're dragging new lights into the scene. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, right, on to the next bit. So, um, just to make sure, yeah. Uh, so, 
following on from the look and feel of your scene, like you've established what kind of vibe you want to go for. In this case, it's a, a stinky sewer. Um, so next thing is cameras, right? Um, so in regards to um, when you're making your cameras, I've always found that going for a cinematic camera um, is always the way to go um, when it's for your renders and um, videos. And this is because they have really cool settings, which allow them to basically emulate any camera in the real world, right? Um, and that's called the film back setting. So that allows you to have direct control over the height and width of the, the view that a camera has. And that can have a really profound effect on how your environment is read. Um, I remember a environment that was dropped just after UE5 was launched. Um, or I think it was just after UE5 was launched where somebody released a video of a railway scene that they'd made, but they did it with a portrait phone film back setting. And it just made it seem so realistic because there was um, there was just that air of, of realism in the way that the camera was set up. And it just really helped sell the environment, even though when you looked at it, everything was still low poly. Um, so, yeah, that is a, a really important thing to do for uh, your renders. Um, so if I just jump into uh, the engine real quick, you'll see I've got cinematic cameras everywhere. Um, so this is something that I do really early in a, in, in a project is I'll start establishing areas where I want key, sh key shots to be. Um, now, that can help the, um, the kind of um, the process of making a scene because you'll know the areas where you need to put the most amount of detail. So uh, one of my favorite shots in, in this particular environment if i can select the camera was this one um so you can kind of uh, start planning your areas around that cinematic camera and you can see that um on my film back settings i've gone for a 64 by 27 millimeter which is a widescreen um cinematic camera view uh, so basically you get the black bars at the top of the bottom um so yeah and then um, this can really help, like, just make you hone in where you need to work for a, for a, a setting. <clears throat> um, on top of this, you've got, uh, like, these focus settings. So this essentially allows you to dial in where your camera will be focusing in this space. So I've got mine at uh, 635 centimeters away. So if I click on the little re uh, draw debug plane, you'll see that I'm focusing on this corner of the wall here. Um, and then that's really helpful for getting a really crisp and realistic look on your depth of field. Um, this is something that you don't want to go crazy overboard with because you can get some really bizarre artifacting. Um, like you can kind of start seeing it in this space here, like where the, the foreground elements are kind of getting that so blurred out that they're kind of artifacting against the background. So you don't want to go too far because otherwise you'll end up getting more than that and it'll just blur into a, a big a big mess and you don't want a big mess. <laughs> um, yeah, so that, that's a, a really nice, tasteful way to, to get your, um, your, your renders to look a bit more realistic and, and give them like an air of realism. Um, and then on top of that, going back to the post-processing thing, um, on these cameras, you've got additive post-processing, which is something that I absolutely adore. So essentially, this means you can have your global post-processor, which everything will be affected by. But locally, you can have specific settings per camera, which will carry across if you duplicate, or it won't influence the scene at all. Um, so as you can see, I've like gone and made edits to, to certain things within this one. Um, so it'll probably be like exposure where I've set the, the compensation to 10 or the bloom. I've increased the intensity because I wanted the, um, the sharp lines coming from this light source here. 
but that won't affect every single camera in uh, or every camera in the scene. Yeah. Does that override the the post process box? Uh, yes, it does. It does yeah. yeah. So yeah, if you if you want to edit something in particular, it will um, override any any box settings. Yeah. Nice. Um, so this is one of my favorite things about cinematic cameras, and one of the reasons why I highly recommend using them. Um, because you know, not every camera in a movie would have the same um, like film grain because the light might influence it, or um, you know, they might want to have more bloom, like I did, or whatever. Yeah. Um, so drop back in here. Um, yeah. So, moving elements. This is something that I try to take into consideration very early on in a project. Um, what kind of things do I want to have moving, be that particle systems in particular areas, um, whether there's going to be movement in materials, be that through vertex world position offset, or um, using transparency maps to influence like um your fog or or steam or things like that or even like um you know when you're using noise on water all that kind of stuff um and then how that can be influenced by your cinematic cameras with their motion blur um because one of the great things about cinematic cameras and uh, the rendering techniques that we'll be going into after afterwards. Um, you can get some really nice results with motion blur that will create uh, a more realistic effect in your final renders. Um, so if I just quickly jump over onto my Chrome, which is here, you'll see on one of the renders that I've taken for my scene, um, we've got like this motion blur on the water. Um, and without that motion blur, you'll see each individual droplet as opposed to it looking like it's cascading, um, which has a really bizarre effect if you're looking at it as a still, right? Um, if you're looking at it in game, you wouldn't notice. But if it's just a single frame, then it, it looks rather iffy. So yeah, taking into consideration what can move and using that to bring a bit more life into your environments is a massive thing. Um, let me drop out of that pilot mode and click on something so it's not rendering twice. Um, so as you can see, I've got like water droplets coming down from the, the grate here. We've got little dust particles floating around in space. Um, we've got steam coming out of every hole in, in the environment. Um, be that through disconnected pipes or coming out from underneath um, broken bits of wood. Um, and then, yeah, more drips and just generally lots of movement coming in through those areas. But then also more subtle movements are coming through in the volumetric fog where we have um, cloud textures, which are literally an environment artist's best friend in situations where you want a bit of movement because the um you can't really see it here but you can you can see the the noise that's being uh used that will imply that there's like movement in in the air of that space um but these kind of textures can be used on anything be that fire or magical effects or whatever um yeah movement is awesome to have in in your environments and just just Make sure that you uh, you utilize that as as a um, something to consider. Basically, um, it's a good tool in your toolbox. Um, but yeah, so if I just look through my notes real quick. <clears throat> oh yeah, that's a good point. Um, so something to consider as environment artists, as I'm sure. Many of you are, or if you're not, then awesome. But um, myself being an environment artist, VFX really isn't my strong suit. So 
that is something that really scared me when coming into wanting to get this kind of thing into uh, this environment. Um, so in that instance, it's a case of don't be scared to use somebody else's VFX, right? Um, if you want to be an environment artist, you're not going to be making the, the world's greatest VFX. You're going to be working on spaces. Um, so don't be scared to use somebody who has made presets or, you know, maybe it's some that Epic Games have released for the month, which in this case is where I got the majority of my VFX from. Um, or maybe one of your friends is a VFX artist and, and you can leverage their assets and they can use your portfolio piece and um, you can use their VFX as, as a showcase. Um, so yeah, don't don't be scared to use other people's VFX in, in instances where, where you want to try and push the boat. Um, they really add a lot to the scene, like just looking at you moving through the space. I think the water droplets and, you know, the whole sort of just, I guess, motion visual effects elements just really, really lift. I think motion adds so much to, to environments. These, you know, like static environments look very dated now, I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I completely agree. I feel like it, it raises the bar yeah. of an environment like so much more beyond uh, a static, uh, a static environment. Um, let me just take a sip of water. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I've kind of covered how this kind of process can also help your stills. Um, but another thing to consider when using um, textures to create motion within a scene, such as the cloud textures, which I mentioned earlier, all it takes is one extra texture sample in your materials to uh, scroll in the opposite direction, and you get infinite variation, basically, in your texture. No one will ever notice uh, a repeat of the same cloud crossing over one another um, because it will always be different. So. That's another little tidbit for you. <laughs> um, yeah, so going on to the chunk of this kind of uh, workshop now, the rendering out settings. So I showed you um, every single camera that I had in my scene earlier. Um, there's probably like 20. Um, not all of them made it through to the final renders, but there's there's a lot in there. Um, and the reason being, I wanted to um, use movie render queue to get the most out of my renders. Um, so for this, um, movie render queue has like these awesome customizable settings, um, which you can save out and leverage across multiple cameras or because you're saving them out as individual files you can even leverage them across multiple different projects if you wanted to um and they allow you to get the physical based motion blur which i mentioned in in the past slide um and they allow you to get individual renders from full video renders if you know what i mean because they'll save out individual images of uh, each frame so um essentially it'll create a folder and then within that folder it'll create like frame zero one two three up to however long your shot is um and then you could pick a frame from within that to be a still image or um in my case what i like to do was set up individual cameras which um i'd have a set amount of frames and then it would go through all of those, and then I'd pick one where, like, the steam is just right or the water droplets are just right, and you can you can capture a bit of life into your images through that method. Um, so if I quickly jump back into the engine real quick, and um, well, you don't really need to see those. So, yeah, as you can see, I've got all of these different sequences set up. Um, this is something that I decided to do, like, when I came to start doing my rendering. I wasn't sure if I wanted to render them out 
within a single sequence or multiple sequences at first. I opted for multiple sequences because it gave me a bit more leeway in how I set things up for my renders. Um, so, for example, I've set up a specific sequence just for the logo. Um, so this essentially allows me to set up an individual camera. If I can pilot it, which is a square view, which matches the dimensions for um, the art station icon page uh, thing, uh, the icon setting. Um, and then this renders out 60 frames worth of images. So that's 60 images overall. Um, and then I can pick one where the particles are, are in the right space for me, where the light's hitting the objects in just the right way. Um, and it'll just give you a bit more uh, customization, basically, within the, um, within the image taking process. I That's replicated really that. Really clever. Yeah. Yeah. yeah thank you. Um, yeah. The um, honestly, like the sequencer is so powerful, and I, I don't think it's used often enough. Um, I did that for every single screenshot that I took for the project. Um, so if I just jump into one, where I think I think this one was one that I used. I can't remember. Yeah, it is. Um, so again, this one, this one renders out, um, you know, however many frames, and then I'll just go through those, um, just, just in windows Explorer and I'll just look through whichever image catches my eye. Um, and then utilize that as a, a screenshot, which I'll take through, um, to the next stage, basically. Um, we also have my movie shots. So I mentioned earlier that I, I rendered out like all of the shots basically individually. Or I think I mentioned that. I can't quite remember. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, all of these shots were rendered out individually as their own sequences. Um, so if I just hit play on this real quick. Um, all of these were just rendered out on their own. And then I took these through into the video editing software. Uh, I think I used DaVinci Resolve in my case um, and compiled all of those images into DaVinci and rendered that out as its own thing so that I could move it around on the timeline outside of the engine. And that basically meant that I could do a lot more um, editing after I was finished with the project in theory, um, I could move where key shots were placed within the, the video rather than having to move the camera cuts around within the engine itself. It just made it a bit easier, or at least in my mind, it made it a bit easier. Did um, you do much color correction or adjustment in Resolve? Um, so, yeah, I, I did do a little bit of color correction in Resolve, but I ended up just porting it back into the engine because... For some reason in my head, I was concerned that it wasn't going to look like the game camera. So all of the color correcting that I did in Resolve, I just made sure that I brought it back into the post-processing within the engine, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. It is super powerful, though, because it allowed me to, to change a lot of the effects within a safe environment without breaking the project. Yeah. Um, so yeah, really, really powerful tool that is. Um, and then another interesting thing that I decided to do for this project was utilize static cameras, um, which are similar to the screenshots, but also like the, the uh, movie renders that I made in that I wanted them to essentially capture... Um, capture video footage, but treat it like a screenshot. Um, so in this instance, essentially, all it really has is a subtle screen shake, no movement on the camera. Um, and then I'd render that out into a video and use that as a video on my, my portfolio page. Um, just so that like, I'd get the benefits of having all of this 
um, all of these particle effects playing and like the cool lighting and, and dust and things because you don't quite get all of that in a still image, right? Um, so yeah, having these subtle little like I think I think they're like twelve second long videos, um, really like has a has a really cool effect on your on your portfolio piece. Um, so yeah, that that's kind of like my take on on why uh, cinematic cameras are awesome and uh, how to render with them. But I suppose there's a bit of logic that goes into using these uh, cameras and making sure that your renders look good as well. And something that I've seen a lot when watching like portfolio reviews or looking at um, other people's videos is a lot of the time um, movement isn't consistent through their shots. Um, so by that, I mean, as the um, as the camera comes in, you'll have like a ramp up to the maximum speed. And then as your shot finishes, it'll ramp back down to the minimum speed. Or um, moving from one shot to another, you'll have um, cameras that are moving forwards and then a camera that is moving backwards in the next shot and it feels really disjointed. Um, so something to take into consideration when you're using, um, you know, your cameras to, to render out videos and whatnot is trying to keep a level of consistency in the movement of your camera. Um, so going back to the, the ramping up and ramping down, make sure that your camera starts before you actually are looking through the lens of that camera, if you know what I mean. So. If I move to a normal shot again, you'll notice I'm fading out as the camera is speeding up, but also the camera is starting to move a long time before um, the shot actually begins. So um, this essentially cuts out the, the ramp up and ramp down. Um, so yeah, giving yourself a buffer zone between the start and end of shots is, is a really good practice to get into, and it'll make your video renders look a lot smoother um, and give them a more professional quality as well. Um, and then also making sure that you have a dynamic, uh, a dynamic shot is also really important. So um, if I quickly take control of this camera again. Oh, my. Might help if I actually clicked on it right. And we cut that back. Um, so having like interesting movements in your camera where you've got dynamic elements such as this little dust particle that's flying along here, or your uh, your little lens flares, um, or having just interesting things to look at, like these little mushroom balls that I've got growing on the side of the wall, or like people wondering what the, the graffiti is saying and things like that. Just having a bit of a dynamic element to your shots really helps sell things as well. Um, super important, super important. So yeah, as well as that, having a distinct mid-grain, foreground and background. Oh my, that's still playing. Having a distinct... <laughs> Foreground, midground, and background um, really helps sell a space as well. So when you're designing a space or you've, you've placed a couple of cameras around and you're like, okay, it's missing a bit of something, it's probably the fact that you've not made a distinctive element to, to have foreground elements, midground elements, and background elements on your shots. Um, so, yeah, having assets that are close to the camera to create a bit of like, oh, I wonder what that is. And then uh, the mid ground is your general composition space. And then the background um, will just be more stuff, but like obviously like fading out and it, it kind of makes you wonder what could be further back there. Um, really helps to generate more of a, a, um, 
a better composition, uh, for lack of a better term. But yeah, going into something that you mentioned earlier, Paul, about uh, post-processing outside of the engine, it's not cheating. Um, if you're not making a space that is going to be played in, and this is something that I fell into a trap of whilst working on this environment because I wanted it to be thought of like a playable space. Sure. Um, it's it's not cheating to to process to process your images outside of the engine. Take it into Photoshop. Take it into Resolve. Um, play with the colors. You know, tweak the brightness. Make something look more real than it does in the engine. Um, it's it's not not cheating. Never cheating. It's all about making right it look as good as you can, I guess, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, I watch a lot of these how to make your um, renders look more cinematic videos on, on YouTube all the time. Yeah. And they always bring up using the post-processing tools outside of the engine. Um, For sure. So yeah, definitely a tool worth utilizing if it's just the portfolio piece. Um, and then, yeah, going into some other considerations because I've just taken note of the time and we're, we're running short now, aren't we? Um, so breaking up of straight lines, um, if I jump into the engine real quick, you'll notice I have props everywhere. Um, and that is basically because you don't want to see a hard straight line that just leads all the way through your, your environment. I think um, Dynasty called them laser lines. Mm -hmm. I think that's what he's mentioned the mouse before. Yep. Um, and that was where I first picked up this little tip um, of just having more things in front of your, your straight lines just makes the space so much more believable and look way better at the same time. Um, another thing to think about when working on a space is what's happening above. Very, very few times have I seen people look at a ceiling and go, all right, we need to do something with that. It's usually a flat surface. You know, you, know, you don't really get much detailing up there. There's a lot of things that you can do with a ceiling to make it look a lot more interesting than just a, a, a brick space as this one would be. If I didn't have any of these pipes or cables or like vines hanging down or like little bits of wooden slats above, it looks really boring. Um, so ceilings are a super key important area to, to make sure that you, you fill out um, and that will really help you see cell. Um, so that's something that I do in every environment. Um, on top of that, uh, don't be afraid to use assets that you made for past environments or um, assets that you had from your asset library from a long time ago. A lot of the props in this environment um, are from an environment which is from my, my graveyard, right? Um, so all of the barrels um, and the little little tools and the toolbox and things, they came from an environment which I was making probably about five years ago. Um, and then I just never did anything with it. And to save like half an hour of modeling, I just got the asset brought it into Substance Painter, tweaked the textures a bit, Bob's your uncle, bang it into the into the um, project, and you've saved yourself valuable minutes, which you can spend doing something that you, you actually want to do, as opposed to modeling something that you've made perfectly fine years ago. Um, yeah. And then, because of the time that I was working on this environment, I was actually... Um, going through some interview processes at the time. And um, one of the key bits of feedback I got from the interviewer, which shocked me, was don't be afraid to use some mega Megascans assets in your environments, right? They can really help sell a space, but also it allows you to have a direct comparison point with something that looks realistic. Um, you know, Megascans are all like top quality photo scans from like really high quality professional um, 3D scanners. And if you've got an asset that looks rubbish next to a mega scans asset, you know that you need to make that asset better, right? I was talking um, to, to Jeremy about this, just to briefly interrupt you, sorry. Um, just about the whole mega scans thing. 
and I know like on the the project that he's doing on stream at the minute, he's doing like um I think it's Shadow of the Colossus or like Ico mm. inspired environment, but he's he repurposed some mega scans. So he downloaded yeah. like the base scans, but then he like he tweaked either materials or he adjusted like maybe like, I think it was like leaves he was using. And he did, mm-hmm. and he was just you know arguing the case that you know like even if you do that that's kind of giving it a little bit of your own identity as well even though you're starting off with like a scanned asset you're kind of like yeah. making it work for the space that you're creating yeah uh, exactly that that's a really good point yeah. um you can always export assets from unreal yeah. so you, you can import it directly into unreal and if it's not quite what you need but it's it's like 70 percent of the way there export it do what you need to do to it re-import it yeah. and you, you're good yeah. um so in this instance a lot of the foliage that you see in this environment um comes from mega scans so like the kind of weeds that i've got growing down is all mega scans assets and then i've interjected some of my own foliage with the vines and um i've got some like little stinging nettles and things at the bottom down here um just to like add some of my own stuff into it um and then i've used some mega scans assets like the bin bags which i'm sure lots of people have used in the past but um it just saves time mm-hmm. and gets you to the, the the end point quicker than if i was to say um go into a cloth sim and try and simulate my own bin bag with cubes and things inside it uh, it's just it's just quicker, mm-hmm. um, and then yeah, I also used a few decals from um, not just Mega Scans, but also a couple of Martin Hoff's environments because I know he was going for a similar vibe in some of his environments. Um, so I, I downloaded those and I used a couple of decals from there. But just make sure that you um, that you credit where credit is due. Don't don't claim it as your own. <laughs> Um, yeah, and lastly, um, always seek feedback from your friends and your peers within a, a community uh, or, or your class. Um, I couldn't have gotten this environment to look as good as I did without half of the people that I, I, I got feedback from in, in this community. So, yeah, thanks, guys. And also, <laughs> and also, yeah, just make sure you do it because it is really handy. Um, I know it can be scary to get feedback from people, especially like in a public eye, but it's really worth doing. Um, and yeah, best ways to learn, I think for sure. Exactly. Like there's so much stuff that you pick up from other people. Um, yeah. so all of the grunge that I've got on my walls came from feedback. Um, all of the retextures work that I did on the barrels came from feedback because I just imported them and was like, ah, that'll do. Because uh, I was used to how they looks, and then somebody was like, "There's not enough detail on them." Um, but yeah, so and then also, don't be afraid to experiment with stuff either. Like a lot of the stuff that I mentioned from this um, this talk, it's very kind of like you should do it like this. But ultimately, I wouldn't have gotten to this point without like tweaking settings, playing with things going off and finding a random tutorial that's just like, you can do this cool thing with a camera. Yeah. Um, so yeah, don't be afraid to experiment with things and don't get stuck in your ideas too early on because stuff will change and it'll look better for it. But yeah, totally. I think I think that's that's it from me. So uh, that was yeah, amazing. thank you. Also, thank you so much. There was such a wealth of information uh, in that talk. I've learned some really useful tips. I think everybody would probably agree with me. There's a couple of questions if you've got time. Um, to yeah. Run through them uh, very quickly. Just let me scroll back up. Um, so just on the mood and tone. Uh, so first question is from me. Uh, obviously, like you know, your mood and tone are very well established in your environments. And I think not only this one, but I've seen some of your other work, and I think that's a big thing that kind of speaks to me about you as an artist you really focus on mood and tone uh mm. have you any resources or anywhere you kind of would suggest that people can maybe develop their understanding of how to establish mood and tone like where did you how did you develop that sort of side of your art where did that come from um so um resource wise 
I generally like to look at uh, there's a, there's a, um, a couple of YouTube accounts that I like to to look at. I'll put the names of them in the chat that would be after the talk. Perfect. Um, but yeah, I think one of them is called William Forker. Is that his name? Yeah, I know who you mean. I, I yeah, he he is. Name, but that I know who you mean. Yeah, he he is a, a brilliant wealth of knowledge. Um, he does everything from how to get awesome lighting, how to get awesome mood. He does stuff with um, photogrammetry renders and things like that. Yeah. And a lot of the the camera tips that I picked up for this piece in particular came from him. Okay. Okay. And then there's also a chap called uh, Punisher, P- Punisher, whatever his name is. <laughs> um, that one. Yeah. Yeah, he he is um, he's also really really good at cinematography. Um, yeah, if you find the so, link to that and drop it in the the workshop chat, that would be that'd be awesome. We'll um, do. We'll for do. anyone who watches Corridor Digital, it's the guy that used to work for them. Yes, uh, Punisher. P W N I S H E R. That's the guy. Yeah, cool. yeah. He he is he is really really good. If you um, have his channel, Steve, if you just want to drop it in the workshop chat for everyone. If you can find it and just post a link, that'll be great. Yeah, sure. Um, he did the videos on like was it, um, taking reference photos and making your own masks from photographs and stuff. Ah, uh, okay. Right, right, right. <clears throat> okay, cool. Um, second question: Did you have any elements or aspects of your project that didn't work out? Uh, so were there things that I think sometimes is a question I get asked a lot by students and things like that is like. You know, they see all these environments and, again, it's the whole, I guess, the artificial side of it, whereby they don't see maybe the failures or the the things that didn't go well or whatever. Were there any aspects sure. of this that didn't, you know, that didn't really work out for you? And um, Yeah, I mean, the, there's there's ideas that I had where um, I, I, so I'll, I'll show you a failed, a failed example of something. Um, the actual architecture for this piece is one whole model um i initially wanted to do this as a um tiling mm-hmm. uh, like a tile kit but because of the curvature i wanted i couldn't achieve that so i spent probably like two nights trying to figure out how to model this thing modularly and ended up just scrapping the entire thing and going for a, a sole mesh right. that um just used tiling textures and dirt masks and things mm. um and then some other examples of things. Um, I wanted to do a lot more with the outside. You can kind of see that I ended up like just throwing in some rubbish messes just to block out the the view as the camera kind of pans into into this kind of shot here. Yeah. But I wanted to do more with the outside originally. That ended up getting scrapped. Um, so yeah, the, there's elements of failed ideas everywhere. <laughs> cool. cool. That's very organic and open as well. Um, okay, that's that question. I think there's two more maybe. Uh, could you explore your ground fog setup a little more? You talked a little bit about um, ground fog and, and, and cloud materials or something like yeah. that, about halfway through. Could you maybe just look at that in a little bit more detail? Yeah, for sure. Um, let me just see if I can actually select the actor <laughs> um, yep. and then go into the material for it. Right, so it's actually super simple. It's a really, really simple material. Um, so essentially, all this material will do is influence your volumetric fog that you've already got in your scene. So this does require a volumetric fog um, actor to be in the scene, okay. whatever they're called. Is it exponential height fog? Mm-hmm. Um, mm, this one here. I can't select it. What word? Uh, yeah, the exponential height fog. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, so it requires one of these to be in your scene. Okay. Um, and then this essentially just um, will allow you to change the uh, the density of the fog in specific areas. Um, and it it can just be a, a primitive shape and you just slap this, this material on um, and it'll just like make it into a, a volume, basically. Um, and give it 3D elements. But yeah, feel free to take a screenshot of this. Um, and that's very um, nice. I I've not seen that before, to be honest. That's this is new to me, so that's that's really cool. Yeah, um, I can explain what the elements are doing if you like. Yeah, if you want to go a bit more in depth. A few minutes, yeah. Mm-hmm. 
Um, yeah, so essentially, this is the, the clave noise that I was talking about for the, um, the moving air. Um, and I'm just panning a, um, I'm just panning it basically over time uh, right. using these values here. Um, and then this is determining how large the texture is based off of um, the world. So it's not using UVs or anything like that. It's world projected. Mm -hmm. And I'm dividing it on the X and Y of the, um, the world UV by 1,500 by default. And I think in the actual scene, it's probably more like 30,000, um, just so that like the, the clouds are far larger and you're getting a lot less repetition. Mm -hmm. um, and then this is the element that is creating the the um, volume effect. Okay. Um, so you're getting the bounds of the object and you're doing a bit of maths to just basically find the middle of it. Um, and then this all kind of combines together into a um, like a multiplied effect with the clouds that you'll end up getting like the, the moving elements. And then I'm just multiplying the color over the top of it. Cool. Um, is three point levels a, a built in node? Yes, it is. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, that works the same as levels in um, Photoshop or, right. or anything like that. So like it's like your yeah. bottom, top, and middle point of a of a gradient or a range. Yeah, exactly, and it allows you to um, control the contrast for the uh, noise. Yeah. Super cool, super cool. Cheers, that's really awesome. Yeah. Thank you. And I think the no last problem. question is uh, from Roxy, and it's about um, visual effects. Uh, so obviously, you looked at visual effects, and you talked about. Um, you know how they sort of really help to um, improve and you know, add to a scene in terms of how things look. Um, mm -hmm. Roxy's question was more about: um, so, would you suggest using as much variety of visual effects in dioramas, or do you think it's more of a, th a thing that you would use more in like a full, a full environment for this? So, obviously, dioramas might have that kind of like sharp cutoff where they, they you know, the edge sure. of the diorama or whatever. So, I guess that's the question. Um, I think this is down to personal taste. Um, honestly, so like if you have a diorama and say it's on like a cutout of earth, um, it'd look really cool to have like little bits of rock or, or dirt falling off of the, the edge or, you know, fires on like fireplaces and things like that. So honestly, yeah, I think it's just down to personal taste. I think having VFX is always better than not having VFX though. Yeah. Okay, so they always I think they're always worthy of consideration because of how much they add to the scene, I guess. Exactly, yeah. Um, it'll it'll just add way more life into anything that you do. So yeah. Cool. Uh, Russell, that was amazing, man. I've I've learned so much already in the in the hour, and I'm, I, as I said before, I guess everybody here has picked up something. I really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, Russell's socials no, are in the channel above. Um, I think somebody correct me if I'm wrong. I'm pretty sure somebody dropped. Uh, yeah, his art station and his Twitter. Uh, are there at um, 1949 timestamp by Joe. So if you're not following Russell, you can drop him a follow on, on both his, uh, his social accounts. Um, but yeah, I really appreciate you taking the time on that. Was, that was awesome. Really, really cool. No, thank you. I really appreciate you giving me the time to, to do it. And uh, thank you for inviting me back. I'm yeah. sorry I couldn't do it last oh, time. <laughs> these, things, these things happen. These things happen. Um, but yeah, there'll be a pint with your name on it in Nottingham on, on Friday as a, a little thank you. So Excellent. I can't it. wait. Awesome. <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, thank you very much for turning out. Um, we had a great audience crowd for the first workshop of season two. I hope you found that useful. Um, obviously, there's lots more planned. Um, you can see details of those in the events tab uh, for the month ahead. And uh, there'll be another talk uh, next Tuesday, I believe it is. But yeah, I hope you all enjoy the rest of your evening. And uh, yeah, we'll see you all again soon.